Good evening and welcome to this AHDB webinar, Enhancing Beneficial Insects in Orchard Crops. I'm Scott Raffle of the AHDB. My job is to disseminate the results of research and best practice work to the fruit industry. So in this evening's uh, webinar, we've got a few housekeeping rules. You can see me, you can hear me, but we can't hear you. So you have all been muted. But don't worry, because if you want to pose any questions during the course of this evening's webinar, there is a question facility, which I'll explain a little bit later. Um, we are timed. We are hoping to finish this webinar around about half past seven or thereafter. And the webinar is being recorded so that people will be able to watch and listen again, those that weren't able to join us tonight. I'm glad to say for those interested in basis and erosive points, uh, these have been applied for and you can register for these. And again, I'll explain a little bit more. So on the right hand side of my slide, you, there's a little mock up of the control panel that you can see hopefully on your computer. And you will see that if you wish to ans ask any questions, there is a question box. And if you can see my mouse moving here, um, this is the question area. So you can type in a question, submit it to us, and we will pose those questions to the speakers after the end of each of their presentations. Basis and Eroso points, as I mentioned, are also on here, so you can add or register your name and your basis registration number there. Um, if you're not able to do that or run out of time, uh, you can forward it to us on email after the event. And as I said just now, we are recording this webinar, so for those that aren't able to join us, it will be uploaded onto the AHDB website uh, later on at a later date so that uh, latecomers can watch it. And that's on the we AHDB website uh, down at the bottom here of, of this page. So why are we interested in, enha in enhancing beneficial insects to orchards? Well, um, as you can see on the left hand side of this slide, there is a picture of a very new fruit wall system, uh, orchard intensive planting, completely devoid of vegetation or any growth other than that on the apple trees. And that's not good um, in, if we want to in, encourage beneficial insects like earwigs around the corridors. So AHDB uh, has been funding a project which finished earlier this year, TF223 is the name. And the purpose of, or one of the purposes of that project was to find ways of actually enhancing the uh, or hastening the influx of beneficial insects into an orchard. We've got we've started uh, devoid of vegetation, but on the right hand side is another picture of a young orchard which has got wildflower strips uh, sown uh, in the alleyways. And Michelle Fountain, the entomologist at NIIBMR, who's one of our talkers, speakers tonight, will explain what she's done in that project by the using uh, by the use of wildflowers and other traps to try and encourage insects into orchards. So we'll be hearing a bit more about that. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to improve pest control by bringing uh, beneficial insects into the orchards uh, and, and also pollinating insects into the orchards more quickly. So a little bit about the programme tonight. You'll be hearing initially from Mike Garrett at the University of Reading, who will talk to us about some uh, pollination work that he's been doing. And we'll hear from Theos Matheos Fierro, who is a PhD student at University of Worcester. His work has focused on cherry orchards, both pollination and beneficial insects. And then finally, as I mentioned, Michelle Fountain from IRBMR will talk to, talk to us about some of the work that we have funded at AHDB, as well as some other PhD study from Megan McCatcher. So we'll kick off with Mike Garrett. Mike is a researcher based at the Centre for Agri-Environmental Research at the University of Reading. His research focuses on managing biodiversity in the farmed landscape to support sustainable crop production. So he's going to tell us all about um, the role of pollinators for UK apples and how growers can actually improve fruit quality through their pollinator management. Mike, a good evening to you. Uh, thank you very much, Scott. Yeah, so um, today I'm going to be talking about some of the research we've been doing recently to try and better understand the role of insect pollinators in supporting production in, in UK apples and also looking at ways we might manage pollination services in a sustainable way to deliver it, improved production and improved crop quality. So we know that insect pollinators are important for apple production and insects are required to bring in viable pollen deposited on apple flowers in order for those flowers to set fruit and to achieve a, a marketable yield. 
in these orchards. But there's still a number of outstanding questions, and we've been trying to address these through a number of projects looking at pollination in, in UK apples. One of the first research questions we had was, was which insects are actually out there they're pollinating UK apples um, at the moment? Now, I, best, I guess the best way to kind of demonstrate this is perhaps by comparing apples with, with some other crops. So at the University of Reading, we've been surveying insect pollinators in different flowering crops um, for a number of years. And the chart you can see uh, on the screen now um, shows the percentage of visits that we see by some potentially important groups of insect pollinators to beans in this case. So that's honeybees, bumblebees, solitary bee or, or wild bees and hoverflies. And as you can see in beans, the vast majority of, of flower visitors are, are bumblebees. If we consider another flowering crop, um, oilseed rape, Again, we see the, these common pollinators or insects visiting oilseed rape flowers, but actually there's a real diversity of other insects we find on oilseed rape flowers, including many different flies and beetles, which may be contributing to pollination. If we think of strawberries, we've seen a different situation again when we survey strawberry crops, and here we find honeybees and, and bumblebees are the most common flower visitors. But importantly for this presentation, I guess, is, is, is apples. Um, and when we survey um, apple orchards, we find a, a diversity of insects visiting the flowers, and including honeybees, bumblebees, a number of different solitary wild bees and hoverflies as well. But, but the, the most abundant visitors in apples we find are honeybees, but also many of these wild pollinators. And particularly uh, as solitary bees, we find are really abundant and potentially really important in terms of pollinating apples, particularly compared to some of those other crops that we've looked at. So which, which wild and solitary bees are, are we finding in apple orchards? Well, predominantly we find andrenid bees, and these are mining bees, and there's a number of species in the UK, but there are three species we find that are really abundant in, in UK apple orchards visiting flowers, and that's Andrena dorsata, Hemaroa, and Nitida. And I'm sure you've seen these, these solitary bees in, in orchards and, and particularly their, their nests that you can often see in bare ground, in sandy soil. You'll, you'll see that they nest in, in, in burrows in the ground and this is where they lay their eggs and they provision those, those eggs with, with pollen in order to reproduce the, the next generation. So these are, are potentially really important pollinators in, in UK apple orchards and we find them in many different orchards pollinating many different varieties of apple. The next research question we had was what contribution might these insect pollinators actually be making to, to apple production, to kind of the bottom line? So we've worked with many different uh, apple varieties and used data sets from around the world to investigate the role of insect pollinators in terms of, of supporting production in, in apples. And we found that almost uh, invariably across apple varieties we find that as you get increased insect pollination, you get increased fruit sets. So you do need those insect pollinators to achieve good fruit sets in almost all apple varieties that we've studied. We've also found that, that good, insect, good levels of insect pollination also increase seed sets in apples for almost all varieties as well. So good pollination means you get more seeds set per, per apple. We've also found that insect pollinators can benefit apple size and actually more pollination produces larger apples. And this is the case for some varieties, particularly some important economic varieties like, like Gala. There are some varieties where there appears to be no link between insect pollination and apple size, but for, for many there are. We found that insect pollination also increases the sugar content of, of, of most apple varieties that we've looked at as well. And we think this is linked to, to affecting the ripening of those fruit. And finally, we find insect pollination improves the shape of a number of apple varieties as well. Um, it, 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 good insect pollination reduces the number of, of irregular shaped apples. So by taking the, these data and looking at our, our understanding of the, the contribution of insect pollinators to, to apple yield and, and quality, we've, we've looked at some, some common and important varieties of apple from the UK, and we've been able to estimate the economic contribution that insect pollinators are currently making to these apple varieties. So the pale uh, bar on this figure you see is, is the output from orchards um, when we've excluded pollinators, and the, the dark gray lines show um, uh, output from orchards with, with normal levels of, of insect pollination that we find. And clearly in the absence of insect pollination, um, output is significantly reduced, um, more than 10,000 pounds per hectare in all four of these varieties. But we do see some variation in this level of dependence on insect pollinators between those varieties. 
So another question we asked was, are there opportunities potentially to perhaps improve apple quality, particularly by, by increasing levels of, of pollination in UK apple orchards? And you can actually test this experimentally by actually going in and, and, and supplementary pollinating apple flowers. We actually manually put pollen on, on flowers to create a kind of theoretical maximal level of, of pollination. And then you can compare the, the fruit developing from these flowers with, with fruit developing on, on, on flowers where, where there's been no pollinators or that have been visited by the, the pollinator community that you find in, in that orchard that you're studying. And we found that um, the number of seeds we find per apple, if you exclude pollinators, very few seeds set per apple and, and often you'll get, uh, get apples with, with no seeds at all. We found that with supplementary pollination, we actually increase the number of seeds per apple in some orchards suggesting there's potential to actually increase pollination in these orchards and increase seed set in these orchards. Now this seed number is important for a number of uh, varieties of apple. So this figure shows how seed set is related to apple size in, in gala fruit and you can see as the number of seeds increases the size of those fruit also increases up to an optimal of about four or five seeds per fruit. We seem to be getting that good sized fruit developing. We also find that the number of seeds is linked directly to the shape of the fruit as well. So this graph shows how the, the proportion of fruit of getting getting class one for shape, i.e. no shape irregularities and they're, they're, they're a well-shaped fruit. The proportion of these fruit increases as the number of seeds increases in these fruit. So these data show that there's, there's a positive link between the level of insect pollination and fruit quality and actually there's potentially opportunities to perhaps um, um, improve pollination in these orchards to improve fruit quality. So the next thing we've been investigating through our research is how we might actively manage pollinators and support more, more stable and more sustainable pollination in UK orchards. If we consider Andrenid bees as an important wild pollinator of apples, in order to support populations of these, these wild bees in orchards, they require a number of things. And, and a really critical thing is, is, is floral resources that provide uh, nectar and pollen for them to feed on uh, and, and, and pollen to provision their, their young. And importantly, providing these floral resources before and after apple flowering is really critical because their, their life cycle and their, their active life cycle uh, uh, stretches beyond just the, the, the flowering period of apples. So they need through food throughout their, their, their active period. But they also need nesting sites. So as I, as I mentioned, the, these bees particularly like nesting in, in bare ground, undisturbed soil, uh, often with, with little vegetation. So, so having available nesting sites is important for supporting populations of these. So as part of our project, we've been working um, with, with growers down in Kent, and we've actually been establishing um, wild pollinator habitats, particularly targeting these, these wild bees in, in and around um, apple orchards. So we've been working with, with, with growers and putting flower margins adjacent, adjacent to, to gala orchards, as in the photo here on, on the left. And we've also been uh, um, extending nesting areas in the apple orchards to try and encourage ground nesting bees. We've actually done this by, by extending the herbicide spray area at the end of rows of apple trees to see if we can promote uh, nesting of bees in these areas. So in our study, we've had six orchards where we've, where we've established flower margins next to the orchards. We've had six orchards where we've established these nesting sites, six orchards where we've, we've put both flowering and nesting sites in those orchards and six orchards, which have been business as, as usual, where we've not put an intervention. So we're crunching these numbers now, um, and, the, and the, the, the figure I'm showing now shows the abundance or activity of solitary bees we find actually visiting apple flowers across these orchards over the three years of the study. And as you can see, the, the numbers of solitary bees has increased over, over the, the period of the project but we see really significant increases, particularly in those orchards where these habitats have been established, either the nesting habitats or the flowering habitats. So this is really encouraging and it shows that these, these habitats are, are supporting the, these wild pollinators. At the moment, we're looking at whether this delivers benefits for production as well for the growers and, and perhaps improves fruit quality. So just to summarize then, um, some of the key messages from what I've, I've been talking about. Um, in terms of floral resources, we've shown that, that, that perennial flower strips can be established alongside commercial orchards. There are some challenges associated with managing these and, and, and cutting regimes are important. And in some of the flower plots, we established 
annual plants in the first year to give a rapid boost of, of nectar and pollen. We found that these flower strips have really worked at attracting uh, pollinators and particularly those target pollinators that we know are important pollinating apples and they do provide that pollen and nectar before and after apple flowering. But we also found that there are, are, are many floral resources that already exist in, in and around um, apple orchards, particularly in the headlands and the alleyways, and these could be managed in a way that, that perhaps increases them. And we've seen these being utilised by wild pollinators, particularly dandelions in the, in the alleyways, for example. In terms of nesting, we we're actually surprised to see how many solitary bees we found nesting um, in the tree rows themselves, in that bare ground under the tree. So this is potentially an important habitat. But we were able to encourage increased ground nesting bees in those herbicide spray areas at the end of the row. So that's a really positive step. It wasn't always the andrenid bees, perhaps, that, that we find are important pollinators. There are many lazier glossum and smaller bees we found nesting there, but these are also potentially contributing to pollination. In terms of the pollinators and pollination, so it seems these flowering habitats and nesting habitats are increasing solitary bee numbers and visits to apples, which is really important. And that pollinators are improving yield and, and particularly fruit quality in a number of apple varieties and that ensuring good seed set and good pollination delivers better quality fruit. But we are finding that there are a, a significant uh, variations between apple varieties in terms of their, their dependence on pollinators. Um, so thank you very much and um, if you've got any questions I'll be happy to try and answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mike. Um, fascinating talk, and you've certainly whetted the appetite because the questions are flooding in. So um, we'll see what we can do for all those of you who have uh, posed questions. Um, I'll put, put them to Mike and see if uh, we can get good answers for you. Uh, Mike, one of the early questions uh, has come in was uh, regarding storage and fruit storage. Do you have any information about indications or links between uh, insect pollination and starch content, calcium content, fruit pressures or storability of fruit? Is that something you've got any knowledge on? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. It's something we've, we've investigated. I mean, working with our, with our industry partners at Worldwide Fruit and Avalon, they, they were interested in this particularly, and so were the growers. So we, so we looked at this, and there is evidence um, from, from other research showing that, that good levels of pollination increases calcium content in fruit which would potentially affect storability. So we investigated that in, in a couple of varieties of apple, but we didn't find a strong link between, between pollination and, and calcium content. We actually found pollination increased apple size, and we actually found concentrations of calcium were then reduced per, per unit, I guess, of, of apple, because the apples were actually larger. So we've not found a strong link in our research between uh, pollination and, and, and calcium content. We also looked at, at starch content, um, and dry matter and we are finding positive links between good seed set and and dry matter in apples so there's a potential link there okay thank you mike a um, couple of others which regarding the uh, or relate to the herbicide strip in apple orchards question here if minor bees like bare ground for nesting why don't we see evidence of them in the herbicide strips any thoughts on that um, so, so if the if the herbis if 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 the herbis strip the, the 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 person asking the question is referring to is, is under the trees. Well, we we do find bees nesting in those um, herbicide strips, and they're actually quite good nesting sites for for these um, for these mining bees. And that's why the the intervention we implemented as part of the study was to actually extend that herbicide strip at the end of the tree rows to see whether we could support um, more nesting. And we are finding that that the bees will nest in these these areas. OK, uh, and another related question was, uh, are, the, are the herbicides having any adverse effect on, on the nesting sites? Uh, that we we don't know the answer. Well, I, I certainly don't know the answer to that question. So the herbicide will remove vegetation, of course, uh, from those areas, which will create more bare ground um, and, and probably increase soil temperatures, which the bees like. Um, but we don't know what the direct negative effects of those herbicides will be on, on the bees themselves. Um, so I don't know that answer, I'm afraid. OK, um, another question. What is the perfect nesting site for bees? Um, if we knew that, <laughs> we, we, we could be we'd be trying to establish these bee, bee nesting sites everywhere. But um, that's a really good question. There's, we know some things that the bees like and some things are still unknown to us. And we, we've got ongoing research really trying to pin down what it is 
that these 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 bees like because you can try and create nesting habitats in some areas and you think it'll work really well you've created some bare ground it's kind of sandy soil but but the bees won't won't nest there and then in other sites um, where, where where you'll find really dense aggregations of ground nesting bees you won't know why why it is that they're there what we do know is is that south facing sites are often uh, have a, have a, an increased nest density and and for some of the bee species clearing that vegetation is important as well but what's critical is that the ground isn't disturbed um, and, 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 and ploughed up or anything like that that's absolutely critical in terms of providing a good nest site for, for, for ground nesting bees but it really depends on species and there's still a number of things we, we don't know um, in terms of what, what makes an ideal nesting site Okay, thank you, Mike. I'm going to squeeze one very last question in for you now. Someone's asked the question, do you know the reason why variety, why there is a difference between pollinator preferences and numbers between different varieties? Um, there, could be a, there could be a number of reasons, and I, I guess it, it, it comes from the pollinator perspective and, and the plant perspective as well. I guess the, 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 the dependence of, of that plant will be on, on pollinators and, and the level of outcrossing needed in order for those fruit to kind of set um, and those seeds to set will be very dependent on, on, on variety. Um, but also the varieties will be different in terms of their kind of floral structure to some extent, the amount of nectar they produce, the amount of pollen they produce, and that will also affect uh, the, the attractiveness of those varieties for different pollinators as well. So we're finding these, these varietal differences in terms of pollinator activity, in terms of dependence, but there's probably another number of mechanisms that, 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 that lead to this. Mike, we've worked you very hard. I think you deserve a, 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 a good rest now. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we must move on in the interest of time. Um, Mike has talked to us about pollinating insects in apples. Um, our next speaker, Theos Matthias Fierro, is going to talk to us a little bit about cherries and not just pollinators, but also other beneficial insects. Um, Theos is a PhD student at the School of Science and the Environment at the University of Worcester, and he's just submitted his PhD thesis. Uh, Theos's interests focus on biodiversity, especially pollinators and natural enemies, and the ecosystem services they provide in crops. His PhD looked at the sustainable production of sweet cherry and investigated the pollination of cherry blossom in combination with methods to enhance the abundance and diversity of natural enemies of cherry pests. Theos, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you for the introduction, Scott. Good, well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about wildflower strips in sweet cherry orchards. So this was my PhD that I did at the University of Worcester. Uh, it was funded by my university, Waitrose and Berry Gardens, in collaboration with the University of Reading and IAPMR. This was a three-year project uh, from 2017 to 2019. So, sweet cherry is important in the UK with an annual production of 3,600 tons, which are worth 11.7 million pounds. But still, this is not enough to meet demands and 16,000 tons of cherries are imported each year to the UK. So the way of, of product, uh, cherry production is achieved under tunnels, but two other key features uh, for this conventional approach are the use of managed pollinators such as honeybees and bathtail bumblebees, which pollinate the crop, Norm most of them the varieties of sweet cherry are self-incompatible. Another key uh, feature is the use of plant protection products, uh, which protect the crops against pests and diseases. However, this is not the most uh, sustainable approach for cherry production, and wildflowers uh, located in the alleyways between the trees of uh, between the, the rows of cherry trees can in, enhance uh, wild pollinators, particularly bumblebees, uh, wild bumblebees queens at this time of the year when cherry blossom, and solitary bees. So these two groups of pollinators are known to be more efficient than managed pollinators and can uh, increase cherry production. Also, natural enemies, including predators and parasitoids, can uh, control cherry pests. So this can be used as part of integrated pest and also pollinator management 
programs. So particularly focusing on conservation biological control, which aims to enhance these beneficial insects in orchards with no human intervention other than a wildflower establishment. So my PhD was conducted uh, in the West Midlands at three, uh, five different sites. Uh, and we compare three different treatments. The first one was the control strips in which uh, we had the original vegetation of an alleyway, dominated by grass species and cut regularly to 10 centimeters high during the growing season. The second treatment was the establishment of these wildflower uh, strips. This is a mix of nine uh, native perennial wildflower species replacing the original vegetation with a single cut at the end of the growing season in late September. So the third treatment that we, we compare was uh, the same mix of wildflowers, but in this case were uh, kept to a height of 20 centimeters during the growing season. So this is a novel approach, a grower friendly strategy, which tries to maximize the benefits from pollination and pressurization services, but minimizing inconvenience for growers. So to promote the establishment of these wildflowers during the first year in 2017, all three alleyways were cut to 10 centimeters. So no difference between treatments were applied during the first year. So treatments were applied after the cherry blossom periods in the years two and three. So the first thing that we wanted to, to determine is uh, pretty much what Mike uh, did in Apple Orchards was to determine uh, how dependent sweet cherry is on pollinators, but also if there were pollin uh, pollination deficits in these orchards. So we compare hand pollination, assuming an optimum pollination, against uh, blossoms exposed to pollinating insects and blossoms where pollinators were excluded. So during the cherry blossom period, I hand pollinated the hand pollination treatment, and before harvest, I determined the fruit set. So uh, this, the, the green part in the middle shows that 30% of the blossoms exposed to pollinating insects became fruit, but only 1% of the blossoms where insects were excluded did. So this shows that uh, pollinators are really important. And from the cherries, uh, the value of cherries, which is 11.7 million, 11.3 are because of pollinators. But the red bar on the left uh, also shows that there was a pollination deficit in the study orchards, about 20%. So profit could be increased about 10,000 pounds per hectare if different man if pollinator management approaches were, were applied. So we wanted to, to determine to what extent these uh, wildflowers could enhance uh, the abundance and richness of pollinators in the, in the alleyways. So, uh, Overall, over the three years, we got more pollinators during the cherry blossom period uh, in the wildflower strips which were cut to 20 centimeters. But if, uh, not so much for species in, 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 at, at this time of the year. But if we disclose this for every year, uh, and as a reminder, I said that we didn't expect uh, differences in the first year and the treatments were applied after the cherry blossom period in the second year. So this is the third year where we were more, most interested in. So at this time, the third year, we got more pollinators in both wildflower strips compared to the control. Results were much more apparent uh, after the cherry blossom period from year two. And overall, we got more uh, pollinators and also a uh, greater species richness in both wildflower strips compared to the control. Similarly, for natural enemies, we got more uh, natural enemies abundance and also richness in both wildflower strips compared to the control. So this allowed uh, natural enemies to spill over to the trees and increase the abundance of natural enemies in cherry trees not so much for for species for family richness but what does it mean in, ter in terms of pest control so as i worked in commercial orchards uh, 
grower supply pesticides and kill pretty much every every pest in, in the crop. So I used uh, Sentinel aphid cards to, to determine the predatory activity of natural enemies. So I glued 10 aphids and I counted the number of aphids which were depleted from these cards. So overall, we got a greater number of, of aphids depleted on the cards that were on in the trees next to the wildflower strips. So wildflower strips enhanced and increased uh, pest regulation services. So this slide is going to show uh, pretty much uh, the establishment cost of the wildflower strips. Ideally, we should have one uh, wildflower strip next to each row of trees. But uh, at least we, we are assuming to have one every other alleyway. This means 6.25% uh, of the whole area. So this calculation, these calculations in this table, I made them uh, based on one hectare orchard. But in largest orchard, it's just to get the proportional value. So the total cost of establishment of wildflower strips is about 330 pounds. But this is for established orchards, as I worked it on. But for new plantations, uh, herbicide and cultivation, cultivation costs can, can be saved. So this total value can be compared to the annual cost uh, in pollination for honeybees and bumblebees, which is about 500 pounds per hectare, and in pesticides, insecticides and acaricides, which is about 400 pounds. So this makes a total of nearly 900 pounds per hectare a year, compared to these 330 pounds, which can last about five years. So moreover, uh, growers can apply for countryside stewardships in which they can receive like 500 pounds if per hectare if they show this mix of wildflowers in orchards. So uh, as conclusion with this project, we can say that uh, wildflowers can be successfully established in orchards under covers, that pollinators are really important to, to underpin yields, but there was a pollination deficit because much pollinators cannot achieve uh, maximum yields. So wildflowers strips can enhance both pollinators and natural enemies, and the greater number of natural enemies can lead to a better pest regulation service. So the wildflowers are a really suitable approach for integrated pest and pollinator management programs. However, there's also a key concern, which is the, the nesting site, um, as Mike was, was telling us about, which has, has to be considered too. So this is pretty much it, me, so I'll take any, any questions now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Theos. Um, that's fascinating, and I'm sure growers and agronomists out there will be particularly pleased that you translated the benefits into some financial figures. Uh, very, very helpful indeed. Um, we have a question for you. Um, can you explain the difference between an actively managed wildflower strip and a standard wildflower strip that you spoke about? Yes, yeah, sir. Maybe I should have mentioned. Well, more, more this. So the standard approach of managing any wildflower is just with a single cut at the end of the growing season. So it's late September normally. But in this project, apart from introducing this mix of wildflowers, we wanted to measure if we could get the same results with this management, in which was to keep the height of this vegetation to 20 centimeters from the end of April, nearly May, to late September. So all the during the whole growth, growing season, the height it was like this big, 20 centimeters. So at this height, the wildflowers can still can still get in, in bloom. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here uh, that you might be able to answer. How far will solitary bees travel from a wildflower strip to the cherry strip? Yeah, it depends on, on, the, on the species, but the average of solitary bees traveling is about 200 meters. It's about one kilometer or even more for bumblebees, but solitary bees normally can travel 200. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. Um, the commercial growers where you did this work, um, have they changed their practices as a result of any of the work that you've been doing so far? 
Well, that's a really good question. We are still uh, trying to, to, well, as I just said, I, I've just submitted all my thesis, so I'm still trying to, to get in touch with all my results for my growers, saying, saying all the benefits. So far, some of them were actually very keen to, to take this, this approach. Uh, not all of them were so keen, but after they, they get the results, they, they start to think, well, differently. So. Yeah, I think that they eventually can can take this approach too. Okay, no, that that would be helpful. Um, I've got time for one more question. I, there are some others coming in at the moment. We might try and deal with those later, but one more at the moment. Is there a risk of pollinators seeding the herbicide strip and complicating subsequent weed control? Yeah, well, I think Mike also covered that part. I I'm not really sure about the answer to to to, to that question. I mean, okay. I, my PhD, I measured abundance and richness, but I related to the wildflower strips. I didn't focus on nesting sites, even if they okay. are also important. Well, if there's time at the end, we might just pick up on, on that question. I've got another one here as well, which I'll pick up on later as well. But for the time being, Theos, thank you very much indeed for sharing all that information with us. Very helpful. Um, yes, which takes us takes us on to our final uh, speaker of this evening, and I introduced and mentioned her earlier on, uh, Michelle Fountain from NIAB EMR. Um, Michelle has done a huge amount of work for us at the AHDB in recent times on a whole range of different pest control and IPM projects, and she's going to tell us a little bit more. Michelle is the Deputy Head of Pest and Pathogen Ecology at NIAB EMR. Uh, who's, she specialises in the minimisation of pesticide use in fruit and other crops. Uh, Michelle is going to develop the theme of beneficial insects a little bit more, how we can enhance their influx into orchards, talking a little bit about the results from our AHDB project, but also some of Meg Megan McCarter's work too. Thank you, Scott. Um, so, yes, as Scott mentioned earlier, I'm going to talk about the AHDB project primarily, um, where we were trying to enhance beneficial insects in newly planted orchards, essentially. But I'll also talk about a couple of other projects um, that we've been involved in, in, which are related. And I wanted firstly to start with um, Megan McCurchin's PhD. Um, so she just uh, published this paper in, cl in collaboration with uh, with her colleagues and essentially she looked at the response of natural enemies in established jazz and raven orchards um, to the provision of wildflower habitat but also the effects of um, orchard pesticides. Um, over the three years of her project she actually found no effect of wildflower strips on um, natural pest regulation unlike Theos in his cherry orchards and that was even though um, hoverfly diversity and species richness were higher where the wildflower strips were implemented. And what the, the reason that she found for this, and this is of key significance to growers, was the, um, the, the effects of the wildflower margins were probably mitigated by the use of plant protection products. So what Megan did is she calculated the cumulative pesticide toxicity in those orchards of repeated sprays and found that these were damaging to the natural enemies, um, especially earwigs, as has been shown before in other studies. So in the AHDB project, uh, we did something slightly different. So we started with the wildflower margins at the establishment of the apple orchards. And we know that a lot of investment goes into establishing these orchards. But as Scott mentioned earlier, um, when they're first set up, there's simplified vegetation or no vegetation cover at all, meaning that you don't have uh, pollen and nectar rich uh, floral species, which can then feed your uh, natural enemies and pollinators. In addition to this, the trees are also very simple. The bark um, is simple and the canopy structure um, doesn't have much complexity to it, which means there's not really many places for natural enemies to shelter. Also, um, natural predators and pollinators obviously haven't built up or haven't had the time to build up over a number of years in these orchards. So we worked with um, six growers where we had um, orchards where a quarter of a hectare was treated with essentially three treatments. So we had alleyway sowings of a, a floral mix. We also had um, a bio refuge, which 
was essentially a small clipping device which was clipped into the canopy of the tree, uh, of each tree at establishment. And then we also implemented some hoverfly attractants, which were um, semiochemical compounds. And both all of these methods have been shown to work um, in previous projects. So here we're combining all three. So the first uh, table I wanted to show you was the establishment of the wildflower mixes. So you can see the, the six orchards there. And in two that you can see the the percentage cover of the wildflower mix in 2018 and in 2019. And in most cases, the, the, the ground cover is actually increasing over time. And we are also assessing this in 2020. So we'll be able to give an update on that. What we have found is that even though the floral um, seed mixes that were uh, sown were very similar, we do get quite different results um, between the orchards themselves. On the left hand side, um, firstly, you can see the untreated area and on the right hand side, you can see the treated area um, for orchard two. And just two of the uh, seeds have established in this orchard. But in orchard three, we've had much better establishment of a wider range of the, the floral resources that we put in. So just moving now on to the results so far from this study, this is a table which summarises a whole, a whole lot of data, but essentially anything that's in green is a positive effect, red is a negative effect of the treatment, um, and then if the writing is in black it was either um, no significant difference between the two treatments, the treated and the untreated, or there was not enough data essentially to be able to analyse it. And you can see that in both 2018 and 19, we generally had a positive impact on natural enemies, including hoverflies, um, spiders, and lacewings. Um, and of interest to growers, we did find uh, fewer codling moth damaged apples in the orchards which had these treatments. We also had a student last year come and do a, a little bit more in depth. Um, data collection on the spiders that we were finding in the treated and untreated um, sides of the orchard. So the light coloured bars are the untreated and the dark coloured bars are the um, orchard segments where we had our treatments. And the, primarily we have the orb, weave, orb weaving spiders in orchards. And also we have, we had significantly more um, money spiders. These are the spiders which are um, spinning these sort of sheet webs um, and they were significantly higher where we had our wildflower interventions. And then interestingly, where we had the um, bio refuges, the wig nests, we found more of these, um, we found the sack spiders actually hiding in there in the daytime. And again, these, these spiders have a different strategy of uh, predating. So these don't spin webs to catch their prey. They actively hunt in the canopy of the tree at night. Um, also in these wig nests, we, we find obviously, they're called wig nests because they're for earwigs essentially, um, but we also find ladybirds and amphicorids in those refuges as well. So I'd just like to briefly mention um, a new project which has started. This is a, an EU funded project called Bespoke. And um, it's here, we, we set it up essentially so that we can develop tools based on the knowledge that we've gathered so far um, to help growers basically both manage these habitat types and also monitor what's happening in the orchards over time. Um, the project involves advisory services and end users, and we also have policy makers and obviously the research institutes in there as well. And there are six North Sea region countries involved in this project. So just to um, go through the main aims of what this project are, firstly, we'll be developing bespoke seed mixes for crops, um, for different crops and different regions. And importantly, and I've got a guideline to show you in a second, um, we'll be developing guidelines for growers to be able to manage the habitat that we're recommending but also giving you tools to be able to monitor the impact that those habitats are have, having over time. And 
essentially sort of going back to what Mike and Theos were talking about, enabling you to be able to measure your pollination services in the different crops. So you'll be able to see whether you do have a deficit and whether you need to put some pollination management practices in place. Um, as part of the project, we're looking at 14 crop types and we've got 72 demonstration sites, one of which is at NIAB MR, and I hope next year we'll be able to have some physical visits to some of those demonstration sites. Um, but essentially what this will all bring together, I hope, is that um, farmers and growers will start to consider pollination as part of their normal crop management practice. So just to highlight this, in the um, menu bar on the right hand side, you should have some um, attachments. So one of the attachments is Theos's grower project report, which is um, summarized in a, it's much shorter than his thesis, you'll be pleased to know, um, but it's summarized and it's um, really, uh, in, there's really good information in there on uh, what benefits you will get from putting uh, floral margins into protected cherry. The other handout that we have is the first handout from the Bespoke Project, which is how to successfully establish perennial wildflower strips um, in and around crops. And really useful on the right hand side, there are the four main problems in the troubleshooting area that we encounter when people set them up and how you might overcome those difficulties. And then I'd just also like to, um, if you get a chance to go on Facebook later, if you could search for Bespoke NSR um, for North Sea Region, and um, it'd be great if you could like the page and also follow, because this is where we'll put all of the, uh, many of the tools that we develop through the Bespoke project. So in conclusion, I would just uh, like to finish by saying that in order to enhance and encourage natural pest regulation and pollination services in orchards. Um, the establishment of floral mixes uh, is really important, but it's actually planning and getting that right from the beginning. So make sure that you plan your seed mix, use the handout to help you do that, and preparing the soil is key to getting this right. Once you've got to that stage and you've got this, these lovely floral alleyways or margins, it's now then the time to start thinking about reining back on the use of some of the plant protection products. So think about thresholds and timing, um, what type of product you're applying and the toxicity of that product to natural enemies and the frequency that some of the products are applied in. If you um, monitor your pollinators and natural enemies as part of this process, hopefully you'll be able to start seeing some of the benefits of wildflower interventions and that will give you more confidence to um, rein back a little bit on pest, prote uh, pest uh, protection products or plant protection products even. And then um, just as an overall summary, while you're doing this, don't just think about these flower margins in isolation, try and think about them as part of um, the farm landscape. So Mike and uh, Theos have already mentioned that these insects have other parts of the life cycle, which could include nesting and overwintering. So think about hedgerow improvements, refuges for natural enemies and nesting sites for bees. And also, as Theos has mentioned, think about how you're going to actively manage these wildflower areas to really get the maximum potential out of them. Try and look at a map of your farm later and look at what areas you have got and what you can do to protect those areas. And if you've got some areas that you think might need a little bit of improvement to boost the numbers of um, beneficials in there, that's also an option. And of course, creating new, new areas um, for natural, enemy, natural enemies and pollinators. But then once you've done that, think about how these habitats link together and try to think about creating corridors so that um, beneficial insects can move around the farm more freely. And that's it from me, so thank you for listening and are there any questions? Thank you indeed Michelle, uh, and you're not getting off lightly because there are lots and lots of questions for you. Um, some have come to others as well, but I think you might be able to answer one or two. I'm going to start off with one that came in earlier um, about mining bees, and because you've got a lot of knowledge about mining bees too. 
Given that mining bees need soil which is not too compact, what would be the best time of year to loosen some bare soil patches? Um, that's a really good question, and I'm not 100% sure about the information about not too compact. So we have a PhD student at the moment who is working on looking at soil compaction um, for mining bees, and actually they do need some, the soil does need some compaction, and um, water infiltration is important and part of that. So when we set our bee scrapes up at East Morling, we did that, I think we did it in the autumn, but, but really it doesn't matter too much when you do it. Um, it I think it's how you, how you do it and where you put them is, that's important. So as has been mentioned earlier, they need to be in a sunny spot and the soil needs to be of a, a good consistency so that the bees can, can dig into the soil. What you might notice is a lot of solitary bees actually nest in the wheelings of um, the vehicles in orchards, and that is quite compacted. So there doesn't seem to be any hard and fast rules, and that's something that Constantinos is hopefully going to be able to tell us in another couple of years so that we can get the, the optimum nesting requirements. Okay, um, another, thank you, Michelle. Another question for you. Should we simply increase more insect refuges in our orchards? Um, definitely. So the Innovate UK project that we had um, showed that the refuges, that if you had a refuge clipped into every tree, that had significantly more impact than, you know, refuges spaced even every other tree. Um, and the results from that project were a reduction in woolly apple aphid and also in codling moth. So it's obviously uh, a question of cost um, but the ideal time to do this is at orchard establishment so while the trees are going in the refuges are being clipped into the trees. Thank you. Um, another question for you Michelle. Bespoke sounds like a great uh, really practical initiative. How long will it be before any advice is forthcoming from Bespoke? Well the, you've already got the first one so the first one is um, how to establish successful uh, flower margins um, and we're working on how to measure the pollination efficacy in your crops at the moment so I imagine so we've set up some pilot studies to back those those methodologies up and we'll have the results of those this autumn so ideally we'd like to get that out to you um, next year and also in terms of surveying bee numbers and bee types in your orchard or pollinator types. Sorry, I'm forgetting hoverflies. Um, we should have that. We should have some guidance on that for you next year as well. There's a massive team behind this project and we're writing reviews on implementing floral margins so that we're, we're bringing basically collating all the published data. And that also includes data on what wildflowers um, insects are visiting so that we can tailor the mix so as Mike was saying it's mostly solitary bees in apple orchards so what we need to do is tailor a mix that is very specific to solitary bees for apple orchards but then we also need to include some floral resource for aphid feeding hoverflies so that we can boost their numbers and lace wings obviously as well and we also think potentially these floral alleyways might divert ants away from the trees as well, which is important in um, rosy apple aphid control. But we need to do a little bit more work on that to show that that's, that's the real effect. OK, and a slightly related question about uh, dissemination of the results of this bespoke project. Uh, will, will there be any possibility of posting updates regularly on websites or LinkedIn, Twitter or anything like that? Yes, that's that's a good point. At the moment, we've got the Facebook page running, but as and when we get pieces of information coming out, we will um, put them on Twitter. We actually haven't put the establishing wildflower mix on Twitter yet because we were saving it for this event. So you can get that from the from the attachments in the bar on the right hand side. But we will post these things out to anyone who needs them. Um, and also we'll be highlighting them on Twitter from the NIABMR Twitter account. 
Great, I, I think that's all for you. Um, we do have another question. I know we've just run over slightly tight on time here, but I'm sure people want to hear the answers to these questions. So I'm, I'm going to try and bring Theos back in. So Theos, if you can unmute. Um, a question for Theos. Um, Theos presented some robust data on pollination. Um, do you have any assessments and results on beneficial predators and how their numbers might influence the pest population development? Well, as I said, I work in commercial orchards and I couldn't measure the activity of the natural enemies on cherry pests because, well, growers employed uh, pesticides and kill everything. So uh, I'm not really sure how effective they are going to be on cherry pests. I couldn't measure that, but uh, most of the species that I, I recorded were generalist species, so they can prey pretty much on anything. Uh, and I I'm quite confident to say that yes, the, the increase of natural enemies and also richness in, in alleyways can control cherry pests. Okay, thank you, Theos. That's very helpful. Um, we come to the end of the questions uh, now. Um, I hope you have all found uh, the presentations to be helpful to this evening and uh, we've answered your questions correctly. So um, we've had a very helpful, useful, uh, enlightening evening. I hope you've all found it beneficial. Thank you, first of all, to all our presenters uh, for presenting so succinctly and for sharing all that information with us. Um, just a few reminders, please uh, remember basis and neuroso forms. If you haven't had a chance to complete those, you can send me your details and I will pass them on to my colleague uh, who's dealing with the registration. Um, if anybody does have any final questions or subsequent questions that you forgot to ask, um, I'm very happy to pass those on to the presenters. There's my email address, scott.raffle at ahdb.org.uk. Please let me know and I'll be happy to, to help out in any way I, I can. Um, as I said earlier, the recording will be made available and the handouts and presentations. Um, if you just search, there is the website there, but uh, what I find easiest to do is if you just search on any search engine for AHDB webinars, you will be taken to our webinar page. And if you then uh, search for uh, horticulture and you will find all, you will find the list of all the horticultural presentations and webinars there. So I hope you've all benefited this evening from uh, our webinar. Please do remember there are a series of webinars produced by the AHDB. Uh, keep, uh, keep having a look on our webinar website uh, for subsequent and forthcoming uh, webinars. And thank you for all your interaction this evening. I think your questions have been extremely helpful and enlightening, and I'm sure they help to uh, provide further information to all. So uh, it, it leaves me to finish off by saying good evening to you all. Thank you for joining us and uh, we hope that you will join us again for more AHDB horticultural webinars. Thank you.